and we're live. Oh my God, we're live. We're live. Hello, I see <laughs> participants joining us. Welcome to another episode of Lunch with Lunsford. Here we are. How's everyone doing? We're great. Yeah. We, we, it's Lunch with, uh, with Marco. We actually just have water. Oh. <laughs> same, I have same. coffee. Maybe so, we'll change it to the hydration station with Mark. It's so exciting to have Jack Noseworthy and Sergio Trujillo today. Mm. Guys. So happy you could join we're, us. We're both thrilled to be on. We're so happy to be having lunch with Lunsford. I know. We don't get to eat during this, though, which is, you know, <laughs> we could. I, I, I am the biggest culprit of eating during Zoom meetings, which I think all my coworkers would rather I didn't do. Yeah. Um, but... Here we are. So are I tried you, to avoid it. Are you actually dressed? Are you dressed all the way from from neck to toe, or are you or are you wearing your shorts or your pajamas? I mean, I went I, I went with jeans today. Oh, oh okay. So, oh. I mean, I'm having a casual Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so what I've been referring to is Zoom chic, the business on the top, PJs on the bottom party. Uh, yes, I love that. Yes, <laughs> very good. That's been most of my days. I've been pretty good about that, but. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna put some headphones in just because I think it might be easier to hear me. Okay. Um, okay. We can hear you just fine on our end. Mm. My roommate and I have got a really good groove down of uh, sharing space, um, but we do have some dueling, dueling meetings sometimes. That's our, our life today. It's the new normal. Yeah, right. <clears throat> We're just going to give it another minute or two to allow a few more people to join us so they don't miss any of the scintillating conversation and, <laughs> and it's going to happen. Great. Um, Jack, I have to say, you have been supplying me with some of the greatest quarantine um, content. <laughs> I have yet to dig into the family who finally is in their living room that you sent me. Oh, that Wait, one. which one did I send you? Oh. Which one did I send you? There's a... There's a you sent me um, family during lockdown does Les Mis or, or Les Mis song. Honey, oh, that's actually really funny. They, they, I haven't done that one yet. Oh, the whole family does um, one day more based on having to be in lockdown with each other. And it's a whole family in the UK that are singing the entire number. And the father is Jean Valjean, the mother plays all the female characters, the girl is Cosette, the boys are are, um, um, uh, I guess, Angel Ross and, and um, the Hugh Panera role. Which one was that? The Young Lover. And they sing the entire song with all rewritten lyrics oh and being on lockdown with their family. It's very, very funny. That's hilarious. Did he send you the oh, I need to watch that. Did you send him this one? I'm going to share Oh, my God. Like no, I did send him that, that one. No, I sent you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, I sent that to so many people yesterday. And she's funny. I, I sent that to so many people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sarah Incredible. was one of the first people I sent it to, actually. I I'll see if I can circulate it to our attendees because I'm sure they're now intrigued on what we're talking about. So I'll see if I can get it across to folks. There is an echo coming on the off the audio i think there's someone who's saying there's an echo i'm not hearing it um sometimes it happens for individual computer systems i did respond to him and i do apologize um i i don't know if anyone else is experiencing that feel free to let us know in the chat and i'll see what i can do on my end i'm worried it might be me i'm just going to mute really quickly okay i think it might have been me but <clears throat> Because okay, I'm hearing from some folks that they're not hearing an echo, so it, it might. I, and I was he playing like computer troubles, but it might be that. All right, so I mean, it's about 12:04. We've got, a, I think, a good quorum of participants in the house. So again, I just want to thank everyone for attending our second episode of Lunch with Lunsford. We're really pleased to bring this content to you in your homes during this trying time. Um, the format's going to be a little bit of uh, a curated conversation between Mark and our wonderful special guests. And at the end, Mark will turn it, uh, open up a Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question at any point during the presentation, you look at the very bottom of your screen. There should be a little Q&A bubble. If you click that, you can ask a question, and Mark will uh, bring it up at the end of the hour. So feel free to ask at any point, but know that Mark won't be able to, to get any Q&A answers before the end of the presentation. 
All right. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. I'm going to sign off here, and I will be watching you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, Jack. Hi, Sergio. Hi, Mark. How's it going? We're, we're, hang, we're hanging in there. Yeah, we're week four. Beginning of week four. So it's it's kind of hard to believe, but yeah, beginning of week four is right. <clears throat> um, where are you coming to? You're in, you're in New York City, yeah. We are. We're we're in we're in uh, uh, New York City uh, in Flatiron, yeah, sort of Chelsea Flatiron area in the in the middle of Manhattan. So great. Nice. You guys. It's, it's funny when it's such a beautiful day. I think you look outside and think, oh, it's so gorgeous out, and then just sort of odd. But um, but it's, it's yeah. Awesome. It is a little eerie. <clears throat> yeah. We we're actually we're, we're our one of our neighbors has a lot of relatives from South Korea. And before all of this began, like three yeah. weeks ago, she began to really inform us about how we should be ordering food, how we should be buckling down, how we should be getting ready. So our entire floor, four families on our floor that were really I mean, were really well prepared. I mean we did our, our shop our shop, you know, way in advance. So we we started on top of it. So in a way, we, that's why it's really for us because we really started on that Monday before we got all the information about the property shut down. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've also I can tell you um, because I know your apartment. <clears throat> you've done the same thing I've done, which is like really position for the natural light. Yeah, so you can be like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we didn't live in Los Angeles for that day. For all of this, we have to know where the where light comes from. <laughs> I know this glow is not natural. This this is is so natural. <laughs> <laughs> and I shaved for the event, obviously, because I, I look like Santa Claus. So I definitely did that. Um, oh. And we strategically chose which side to sit on, understanding which way it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about, all about angles. It's all about angles. We didn't think about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I cut my own hair, which was a total disaster, which is basically the only reason there's product in it right now, because then I could like go messy and you can't know, but the back is, it's a, it's a nightmare. Um, okay, Lunch with Lustford. So we're, we're here to talk about all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a lot about Audubon, of course, um, because uh, it was such uh, an incredible project that, that we all got to work on. And it's really, I mean, personally, it's like where our friendship was really forged was, was working on that project. Um, so it's um, for a lot of reasons why it's so memorable to me. <clears throat> it's because I walked away with it, with such a close friendship with two of you. Um, so we're, gonna, we're definitely going to jump into that. Um, but I also, I just want to, there are questions I have for you both that I've actually never asked you personally or socially, <laughs> um, which is just a lot about like <clears throat> your history, both as performers, as dancers, how you met. Um, I want to get into all that, all that sort of, you know, um, gushy detail. Um, but I thought I would open actually, we're not going to jump right into Audubon, but I thought I might open um, just showing the trailer for the production because I think it will... Give, if there are any folks on who didn't get to see the show, it'll kind of give them some context. And so when we jump in later, they'll have sort of a sense of it. Um, and then later on, we'll show a clip of one of the sort of focus stances from the piece. Um, so I'm going to try my best here at the tech, do a little share. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. Great. All right, so this is the sort of promotional trailer for ART, but John Weidman, who um, I know worked really closely with you, Sergio, on, on crafting the story, gives us, I think, a really good setup in this trailer. So here we go. <laughs> Audubon is a story of a young girl at the age of 18. She leaves her favela where she lives outside the city and embarks on an adventure. But the context in which this takes place between 1976 and 1983, when the junta which ruled Argentina systematically disappeared 30,000 people. Lo que nos conecta a nosotros con la, con la historia es que nosotros la vivimos muy cerca, la vivimos en carne propia. Tango is a dance that has been expanded worldwide. We want to really find a, a language and dance that was parallel to what we were trying to do in Brazil. 
purpose, passionate, it's dynamic, it's compelling, it's emotional. I'm hoping it's a lot of value. So exciting. You just you just to watch that and bring back all the memories. Um, so, you know, I, I, one of the things about Autoball that was, I think, so exciting for our audiences, exciting for me for sure, um, is really getting to focus dance as the, as the main part of storytelling, which I think theater audiences were always so amazed by choreography and choreography, obviously, and, and dance are such a major part of musical theater. Um, but it doesn't always, I think, get the sort of focus it deserves um, as a major part of the storytelling. And, and doing a piece like Autoball, I think, puts that front and center. Um, which kind of segues for me into the two of you. And, and I would love for you both just to talk about a little bit getting your start in, in music theater, sort of what drew you as performers. And I think in that, we get to the story of how the two of you met, which I'm so dying to hear. So that's that's where I hand it off to the two of you. Perfect. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, 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 I'll go for it. Um, I grew up doing musical theater in Massachusetts, um, uh, in church, uh, and then in um, some extracurricular activities uh, with my high school and all the drama program, um, the Boston Globe, at one point sponsored a drama festival, I believe, a statewide drama festival, um, which I, I had been involved in uh, uh, throughout my four years of high school. I ended up going to college. I went to the Boston Conservatory, which is now the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. Um, I got a degree in uh, uh, dance and musical theater. So, um, and then while I was in school, um, uh, I, decided that it was time for me to actually try to have this career. And um, I went to New York on a, um, my, the Christmas break of my senior year, uh, after spending years doing summer stock, and I worked uh, at Bush Gardens in Tampa, Florida, in a show called Kaleidoscope, um, where I'm wearing a all white jumpsuit and um, jazz, canvas jazz shoes. And I sang, I go to Rio with big ruffly feathers on my, Please. <laughs> Wait, you didn't yeah, this video. I'm doing a salsa and singing I Go to Rio on top of the box that eventually became the George M. Cohan number in a red, white, and blue striped dress. That's the God's on the street. Uh, I love that. came off when I was in a red, white, and blue dress singing. Um, uh, I think it was her name was Mary, funnily enough. Really <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, <laughs> That's the truth. Um, oh my God! Yeah, Where I, are those photos? Yeah, no, no, they're around. There might even be a video. Um, <laughs> the, the, costume, the sleeves come off on a Friday night here in New York. We all put it on, pull the sleeves off, and we do numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you come over, Mark, we'll just we'll try it on. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm so I'm holding you to that for sure. Forty-five minutes in, in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I came to New York and uh, I went to an open non-equity call, um, a non-union call for uh, for Cats on Broadway. And um, after a couple of days of auditioning, um, uh, I got down to the end. There were just four of us left. Uh, uh, two months later, I started my senior year, my second semester, my senior year of school, and they called and they offered me the job. And I went on the road. So my first job, my very first union audition was uh, I ended up getting uh, uh, this role in the National Touring Company of Cats, and that really started my career. Um, and uh, so that's how I started as a dancer. And I really, uh, I did, I went from Cats to Jerome Robbins to a chorus line, back to back all on Broadway. So um, that really kicked off my dance career and and, and, um, and sort of leads to um, Sergio. So I'm trying to encapsulate it. So, you know. yeah, yeah, I'll give you a, I'm a, so I grew up in Colombia. My family immigrated from Colombia to Canada, Toronto, in the mid seventies. We left Colombia because things were, were, were rough, were tough, you know, with the cartels so on and so forth. At the age of, uh, in my mid-20s, um, I was going to the University of Toronto. I was studying biochemistry. Then I went to chiropractic school. But really what I wanted to do was really dance. So I took a sabbatical from chiropractic school uh, in my second year. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to dance, I got to go to where the best are at. So I came to New York City. And uh, things didn't work, weren't working out so well in New York City. Then I, moved, I went to L.A. because I also wanted, you know, I came to New York because I wanted to be on Broadway. Things were going so well, I went out to the West Coast, and I thought, you know, because I wanted to do music, I wanted to do 
videos, television, films, so on and so forth. But it was while I was in LA that I auditioned for uh, for the for a comp for a, uh, the comp the LA company of of, of Joe Marvin's Broadway. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, a jazz teacher by the name of Jackie Slide came to me one day and she said, you know, they're having an audition for a Broadway show called Your Own Robin on Broadway. You should go. And I didn't even know at the time. I didn't know who Your Own Robin was. But I went to the audition anyway. I got kept all the way to the end. I danced like, oh, it's amazing. Jerry Mitchell happened to be at the audition because he was the associate choreographer for Your Own Robin. And um, Jerry <clears throat> was incredibly supportive. And, uh, you know, I didn't hear, so I went on with my life. You know, I didn't hear from, from, from what happened, you know, if I was, they liked me, if they didn't, if I was kept, if I was getting hired or not. I didn't hear for a long time. This is in July of 1989. I was, I was supposed to go back to school that September. I thought, you know what, I'm done. You know, this is what it's, I'm not meant to be dancing. I'm supposed to go back to school. And then in mid-July, I got a call that to come in, to be the, uh, one of the first replacements on the company of Jerome on Broadway. Uh, and uh, oh that phone call changed my life. And that is where Jack yeah. and I, here we are uh, 30 years later, or a little bit over 30 years later. Um, I know. I'm going to be at the right place at the right time, you know, with, with the, you know, a really wonderful friend who really saw that my talent and, and you know, picked me out of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a forest. So here we are. <laughs> Yeah, 30 years and a Tony Award later. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, you know, it, it, it strikes me, um, in particular, um, Sergio, when, like, when we look at a lot of your work, um, as a dancer, you're also sort of this, like, cultural interpreter, right? I think that comes through on Audubon, and then we look at Jersey Boys and Ain't Too Proud, um, and we see a lot of like how you study dance as a, as a cultural way of storytelling and, and really become proficient in that. Like the, certainly there's a Sergio Trujillo style, but <clears throat> you like adapt so specifically to the storytelling, which I think is what makes you such a unique theater choreographer in particular. And I just wonder if you can talk about that as a process a little bit, like what inspired you as a dancer to sort of look at that in a, in a wider, wider scope. Oh, thank you, Mark. I, I, I like the cultural interpreter. I'm going to steal that, and I like that very much. Hey, just um, cite me, you know, whenever. <laughs> <laughs> or just tag me on Instagram, whatever you need to do. <laughs> Some people are influencers. You're a cultural <laughs> interpreter. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> I, 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 uh, you know, I used to, when they asked me, it's a long-winded, you know, uh, answer, in, but cultural interpreter to sort of see. Yeah, cultural interpreter. I, hey, you know. I was no. just assaulted. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I think I, I was, you know, I, as a dancer, I was very, very fortunate that, I mean, my first Broadway show was Jerome Robbins Broadway. And Jerome Robbins was that, you know, kind, you know that kind of a choreographer and director you, that, you know, when you look at Jerome, you know, you don't, you know, it's not like you can really see stylistically that was like Jerome Robbins. You know, he didn't use the hands, the fingers. You know, he really was a chameleon of sorts, and it was very important for him to culturally present the story, right? So that was my first. So in, in essence, I was taking a master's class in choreography when I was doing that show. We did On the Town, The Rock the Roof, West Side Story, so on and so forth. And what a great way for me to start. And throughout my career, my, my career as a dancer, I kept my, my eyes and ears open, you know, to be able to, for me to dance in, in, in Guys and Dolls with, with Jerry Zacks, to be able to be in Kiss of a Spider Woman, directed by Hal Prince, choreographed by Rob Marshall. Yeah. And then my final show, so I had a 10 year career, and my final show was Fosse. So it begins, mm. my career began with, with Robbins and ended with Fosse. And through all of that the decade, I, I really was studying from everybody. And, and I made sure that as I, was, as I was working, you know, I also put it out there that I wanted to assist and be associated to all these various choreographers. And so, you know, that was the beginning and, and, my, and my education. But more important, I think, so what's important to me when I'm choreographing a show is that I don't impose the way I dance on a piece. Rather, I take the story, I study the culture, I study the dances of that period, I, I study how people move, and then take that information and allow it to empower me as I, as I create. So when I walk into a room, Jack, Jack has a very interesting story. Excuse me if I'm breaking 
That's right. how you describe it. But when Jack did Mother Courage with Meryl Streep uh, at the park, uh, directed by George Sue Wolf, I remember you said that you asked her, she said, how do you get into the main character? And you said, I think you said that, or someone asked her. And she said, <clears throat> I find the character through the voice of the character. And for me is mm. my gateway into into my work is how does how do the characters move? Like what is their vocabulary? What is and that is how I, I begin the process and that is how I make sure that every show's every show is different. Not because I want to make it different, but because I'm really servicing the story, the narrative, and more specifically the character. And I would say one of the things that really started that foundation was Jerry, right? Because Jerry really um, Jerry really was to see Jerry um, uh, teach a number, right? So when we were doing Robbins, right, to watch Jerry Robbins, actually he recreated all the numbers from all of his shows on this ensemble of dancers that he that he had uh, put together. So to watch Jerry play Tevya, um, to watch Jerry get stabbed in West Side Story and, and hand the knife work, he did that better than anyone else. So Jerry was literally, he would interpret his own work, but with, you know, he was part of the actor studio, right? So he, he, he was able to take that human emotion and physicalize it in a way that in many ways was super pedestrian, right? And then it was, it was so pedestrian, and that would be the foundation of it, which I think is what has influenced Sergio so much, is to be able to take movement and emotion and then interpret it, you know, Jerry interpreted it specifically for whatever he was working on. And similarly, as that foundation of learning that we had from working with Jerry, Sergio has done the same thing. It was pretty spectacular. I mean, to see Jerry play Tuck Tim or, or Grandmother's Idol, you know, or any one of the number right. of characters in one of Jerry's shows, he would interpret that physically. And the, and the audience, I think, felt almost like they were capable of, um, they were part of it. They, they were capable of actually... Oh, you would leave a Jerry Robbins show think, I can dance, or I could do that, um, which is, which is uh, I think, what has made his shows, um, among many reasons, made them so long-lasting is because they're, um, they, uh, they connect with, um, I, I think, uh, 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 m m uh, many, layer, many classes of people. Mm. Um, and I think Sergio says the same when you look at Jersey Boys, you look at H.E. Proud, look at something simple like Next to Normal. I mean, there's movement, there's ways that he interprets yeah. So, Jack, it's really like it, it, it's a perfect segue into a question I have for you, which is that, you know, as a performer, um, we talk a lot. We talk a lot about being triple threats, right? <laughs> singer, actor, dancer. And I'm a singer first, or, or, or whatever. <laughs> and I think what's always impressed me so much about your success as a performer is that you really have approached each of those as their own craft, right? Like you, you developed as a as a dancer, as an actor, and as a singer sort of in such a deliberate way. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, as an artist, how you sort of approach thinking about those disciplines, either together or separately, um, and how you've built sort of a career around being so masterful in each. Sure. Um, at this, sure, he's just going to check. We also have another creation, which is called a son who is two. Um, oh, yeah. And containing himself in the other room, so Sergio's going to go check on him while I, while I talk to you for a second. Um, okay. um, I, I think at, at the center of it, really, um, it, it, it's always been about we're, we're just, as a performer, as an actor, as a singer, as a dancer, you're really just a conduit for someone else's material, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> understanding that and knowing that this is our vessel, this is our instrument, you have to work on, on you have to compartmentalize all of the things that allow you to get to do that so that you can be a conduit for the writer, for the director, for the, uh, the composer, for the lyricist, right? So in a musical, which is the, I think maybe the only true American art form, right, is jazz and musical theater. I, I'm not sure someone mm. out there might know the answer to that, but I think those are two original art forms. They are, um, they, when they, when they were brought together in, 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 uh, uh, in musicals, right, in Oklahoma, you're, in, in, in order to be able to do all three things, um, uh, you, you have to work on them separately, but understand how they all come together to tell the story. Um, and so I think always understanding that has been, has been something that's driven me when I'm working, when I was training, 
Um, I mean, I guess you're always training, but when you're seriously training, knowing that when I was dancing, I wanted to dance with the dancers and be a dancer. When I was working on my voice, I, I, I wanted to be a singer. And when I was working in acting class and developing my acting training, I, I wanted nothing but to be able to express myself honestly through the character and the text as an actor. And then bringing all three together, you just you start to develop this, this understanding of, of how how you kind of like turn the fire up on one and put the fire down on another one. And then until you, maybe you're bringing it all to a boil and then you're, you know, so it's just understanding the levels in, in which you're working in the genre, the medium, or, or, um, or, or with another individual and what they need and what the material needs. I think, I think it's complicated, but I think that that's, that's the, the easiest way for me to think about it is that, you know, you, you, you want to sing with the singers, dance with the dancers and act with the actors. Right, right. And produce of the producers, which I... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which, you know, is, is I think, um, one of the... How you and I met, of course, um, was with you as, as the producer on, on Otterball. <clears throat> and it's what I see now, like, you, you're sort of, like, creating this world as a producer that is so you. Um, and it, it's similar to me, I think, how folks approach their performance disciplines, right? And, and train and learn and, and, and develop. Um, they're super, super exciting. Okay, we should get into Otterball. The thing I forget on these situations is like, uh, the, this Lunch with Lunsford situation is that like, we're chatty, 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 and I could talk to the two of you for four hours before we'd even know the time had passed. And then I look up and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we're already at 12.30, what are we gonna do? Um, so, so I wanna make sure we have plenty of time here to. Um, to talk about um, Autoball, um, I just wonder, it, it, sort of, it, sort of the trailer did this for us a bit, but if, if you can give us like the Cliff Notes version of the story of the show, sort of what we're examining in the show. Do you mind, do you, sorry, I, 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 uh, do you mind if I tell you how we, how we got to that place first? Yeah, 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 great. It's a really interesting journey to get to Autoball uh, because um, just because of where where, where I'm at in my career. Um, but the, Gustavo Santolaya, who is the, a, a very, very famous Argentinian composer and, um, and, a, and a two-time Academy Award winner, um, but he won an Academy Award for Babel and composing the music for Babel and Brokeback Mountain. Mm. Babel had an interest in creating a, a show, a musical story, using his music he's got a, a very uh, very popular tango band called uh band called Baja Fondo and what they've done is he's created he's he's fused tango electronic music rock and he's melted into this incredible sound and this his this music is so theatrical so when he mm. when he called me I said sure you know I would love to talk to you it's about what would be great would be for me to to go to Argentina in Argentina so we can talk and I've never been to Argentina before and because I want I wanted to immerse myself in the culture and really figure out if there was something there that we could actually you know that there was you know if there was something there and so um um we talked a lot about uh, he had an idea you know that was that was uh, to me quite simple and and cliche it was about a young girl who um, lives in a favela, who ventures into the city, and then she ends up in a tango bar, and things happen to her, and she grows up, which I thought was uh, slightly, again, cliche, in, in a way, um, predictable. So while I was in Argentina, you know, I just, I was walking around, and I remember I was on my, on my trip back from Buenos Aires to New York, and I was reading one of the, you know, one of uh, uh, Aerolíneas Argentina, one of those air, uh, airplane pamphlets, and in it was a story about a young girl who was the the, the granddaughter of a disappeared. Now, um, I just mm -hmm. want to just a little little clip note about. So, between 1976 and 1983, a military junta took over uh, the government through a coup d'état, and in that period of time, 30,000 Argentinians disappeared. They were murdered. They were first kidnapped and murdered. So, um, and so what this girl wanted to do was she wanted to find out really the truth of what happened to her grandfather. So I just thought that was an interesting, that was interesting. And then, so I thought, okay, 
what if, and so I, I immediately contacted John Wyman because I knew John Wyman through his success of, you know, working with Susan Stroman on, in contact, but also working together with Steven Sondheim. He, and John really understands dance. And I, you know, I, was, mm. I had all of these sort of restless ideas, but I didn't know quite how to figure out how to put them all together. So I called John, I told him about the project. I, I sort of thought, I said, John, what, you know, what if, and this is all really quick, quick way of telling you the story, but you know, what if, um, what if the idea is, is that this young girl, what she wants to do is she wants to find out what happened to her father who had disappeared. And from there, you know, that was like the beginning of us crafting this story. And in essence, what happens in our show is, is that Arabal, who is the, the, the name of the young girl, and Arabal means a, 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 a little uh, neighborhood. It's in, and they're usually small little neighborhoods in favelas, right? So shanty towns. And so what if on the 18th anniversary of her father's disappearance, she ventures into the into Buenos Aires mm -hmm. to find out what happened to her father? Uh, and that was that was the beginning uh, of of the show we created, and uh, it took us a while to arrive to you know the actual show until we actually did it at ART under you know under under you know the the great guidance and support of, of the entire uh, ART team with with you know with Diane Paulus and Diane Berger and yourself and and, and Ryan. Um, so I mean. This show, I'm very proud of the show, uh, and it and it also what it did was it, it it ignited this real need and desire for me to make sure that stories, Latinx stories, are are being told and are and we are re yeah. represented. Yeah, I, I think um, it's also and, and Jack, I'm hoping you can talk about this a little bit. Um, it's had such in, in that journey to ART, right? It's it sort of was not on this traditional um, developmental track that we think about when we think of new plays or music theater, right? We, we do our 20 hour reading and then we do our three, three week workshop and then we get into the theater, right? You guys like really hit the ground running because so much of this really had to be tried in performance. Um, and so Jack, I wonder if you can talk about a little bit that journey from Canada to Columbia to, to ART. Sure. So, um, so there, uh, Sergio had worked on the material and brought it up to, uh, to Canada and done a production in Canada and that, um, um, that had uh, gotten to a certain place in its development and had uh, sort of stalled. And it was something when I was emerging uh, as a producer, it was something that I always had a lot of passion for. I think um, mostly because I, I think at that point, it was the best work I'd ever seen my husband do. And, and there was a personal uh, need for that that work to be seen by as many people as possible for him, but also because I thought the piece was so meaningful and it's the kind of theater that I want to see when I go to the theater. Um, and so I never forgot that first experience I had when I saw the show and I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. It's mm. it has social significance. It's, it's got this rock and score. It's see, it's arresting. It's a, it's a resting, it's visually exciting. And I thought this piece deserves to be seen by as many people as possible. And driven by that need is, is really what, what, you know, propelled me forward to want to keep it going. Um, uh, collectively, we were able to um, submit to a, a festival in, um, in Bogota, Colombia. Um, Sergio's from Colombia. He's from Cali, Colombia. So we submitted to this international theater festival, similar, I would imagine to, um, uh, the Fringe Festival, you know, it, it's a it's a Latin American Fringe Festival S, right? So yeah. And um and um we submitted the piece and were accepted to be part of their uh, gala opening um uh, festival. It's, it's uh, called uh, the Ibero American Theater Festival, biannual Ibero American Theater Festival. Um, and that was uh, oh, it, it took about six months. So from the time we were accepted for about six months, and then um. I had to go ahead and raise the money because they gave us a certain amount of funds and then we had to um, enhance that and then bring, oh, he's checking on our other production again. And then, and then um, work together with the festival to put the piece together. Subsequently, we started um, chatting with, uh, with uh, you folks about, uh, you know, our, uh, and, and, and all, lots of regional leaders, to be honest with you, to find out how can we find another audience for this piece. Um, and and um, that's what really kicked off the um, yeah. the excitement about the material was that not only was it uh, not only was it Sergio, but it was also now being created in, in Argentina 
developed in South America, in, uh, in, in Bogota, Colombia, and then subsequently finding an audience for it with you guys in Boston. It had such a, almost a natural and um, an organic, proper trajectory that was unlike anything else that really happens in, in within our known, you know, theater developmental stages. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and then of course for Air 2, we rehearsed in Buenos Aires. Did. Um, and I yeah, got the great pleasure to join you there. <laughs> Talking about how we got to rehearse in Buenos Aires. Wait, so do you, wait, okay. Mark just yeah. said, we got to rehearse in Buenos Aires, so he's going to ask the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing I have, I don't know if I've ever told you guys this, but, you know, Diane Borger was supposed to come down for a rehearsal for however many days, right? And then I can't even remember, but there was, there was a reason that she couldn't leave Cambridge. She had to be here for something else. And so she came to me like a week before and she said, I think you need to go to Buenos Aires to be with Jack and Sergio because I can't go anymore. And I'm embarrassed to say that like, I don't know what was happening here at the moment. We must have been working on a lot of projects because my first reaction was like, oh, I don't, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Right? <laughs> Buenos Aires. I remember, I remember being on the phone with my mom and I was like, Oh, it works so hard right now. There's just so many things going on. Now I have to go to Argentina for rehearsal. And my mom was like, would you listen to yourself? <laughs> um, you know, and then of course I got to go and it was so amazing and beautiful and, uh, you know, a really, really incredible time. Um, I actually have a picture. I think I can get this to you. looking for the picture. One of the reasons I'll just I'll share one of the reasons why we rehearsed in Argentina was because the entire company was Argentinian. Right from the beginning, mm, yeah. they were very supportive about my idea and the concept that I really wanted to have to be as authentic as possible. And that meant really hiring Argentinian dancers, actors, and musicians. And and most of it, you know, the truth of it was because I really wanted um not only because of the authenticity of the dance. But, you know, some of these people have had lived the experience. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. our, our violinist, Julio, um, his father was a disappeared and his father was almost killed. And, and, you know, he was, luckily he was, he was uh, 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 rescued by, by a miracle, really. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, so that was, that was why we reversed in our, in our Argentina to one of yeah, yeah. Because, because ART wanted us to rehearse in ART, that's because <laughs> yeah, yeah. you were generous enough for allowing me to do that. It's, it's wild. I mean, Sergio, it, it, it really brings up for me, like, <clears throat> shows this combination of you and Julio Zarita, um, sort of the, the, this just sort of like exceptional tango dancing and how that has been molded so well here to like tell the story so clearly without words. Um, I do talk about that collaboration with Julio a little bit. Yeah. One of the things that uh, Wendy wanted to make sure that happened with this particular piece is that we weren't really, again, falling prey to the cliches of tango, uh, because this music is so incredibly unique, it's its own thing, and so I wanted to create a vocabulary that was, that was, you know, there is contemporary movement in it, you know, you still, still know that it's tango, but it has its own style, its own point of view, and I also wanted to the, 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 there to be um, to be as theatrical as the music is, and again, mm -hmm. the story was actually the most important thing in the narrative. You know so what happens with tango, and it's a beautiful thing. I think it's it is the dance that is allows people to be really connected. And so you know, people, you know, what they do, and it was beautiful in Argentina because people, you know, they would put their face face to face. No one ever looked up. You know, it's such a such a uh, an intimate dance, but I needed it to have a different, you know, a different approach. I wanted connection for them to be able to look for them to relax. So it required some some real collaboration between between Julio and I. Julio had never done, uh, you know, a theater piece before. So um, again, in having dancers of this nature, the dancers that are in this show, they've all been classically trained. They have contemporary training, and they're also tango dancers. And after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm just going to show some of the production photos to give folks a sense of the space because we really did try to um, turn this into kind of a milonga for the audience, right? And so um, 
this is probably the last question because then I should get into uh, asking some questions from the audience. <laughs> um, but I wonder if, A, you know, Jack, when we first talked about this, you had talked about the importance of getting the audience sort of lower to the stage. Um, and then, Sergio, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about La Catedral, which inspired, you know, Ricardo's scenic design. And I'm showing some photos here. <clears throat> Um, I think you want me to go first, Mark. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think part of the idea was really to um, it, it, it was to get the artist as as close as possible, and and like you said, create an uh, an atmosphere of a milonga, and and because it really does right right when you walked in, you guys were so successful at that. Um, is, is making f people feel like they were we transformed the space in a way that that your audiences had never seen it been done before, um, and so so to think that um, they were walking in and stepping down into this other area um, and were as much part of the show itself as the dancers on stage. It allowed the dancers to. Um, to engage with the audience, if, you know, they walked through the tables, they 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 were um, uh, reacting with them. The audience was a part of the show, physically as much as a part of the show, emotionally and going on the journey with them. Um, excuse me, the folks that were sitting in the the upper section of your audience, you know, you find yourselves watching them watching the show. So it became, yeah. it, really, it just became this whole experience, which I think was. Um, Super successful, and, and really what what we had aspired to do. Um, uh, you talk about the set design. Yeah. So you know, one of the the place where I where I, where we work, where we workshop and rehearsed this show in Argentina was a place called La Catedral. And La Catedral is this decadent tango bar. It's on, it's unconventional because most of the tango bars are very clean, the lights are on, but this particular place is an old warehouse and you walk up these really creaky steps. But then when you walk into the space, it's like nothing you've ever seen. And the walls are, you know, they're 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 musty and greenish and they've you know years and years of it and there is real incredible unique art in it. The floors are hardwood floors, but they've been aged, they've been danced on for decades. I'm gonna and, get some pictures here. Yeah, when I was creating in that space, you know, I, I actually also wanted to work on, on uh, in Argentina because I, I wanted to create a piece of theater that was not, not like a traditional Broadway show. I didn't wanna, you know, I every day, of my life, I'm I'm following. You know, I'm I'm, I'm working on on a broad on Broadway musicals. I wanted to create something unique, but also more important to stay to, to stay really authentic. And yeah. so, when you walk into when you walk into this bar, and this is the tradition uh, of a milonga in Argentina. When you walk into this great place, before it gets going, the audience or the, the patrons are they, you can take tango lessons. Mm. Or so they and a lot of tourists come, but you know also locals, and they dance and they learn, and there's this real, there's real, uh, and a uh, feeling of community, and um, and so part of what we did at at, um, at the ART was we created uh, this idea that when the audience walked in, they walked into a milonga, but before the show got go got going, we taught. Uh, tango classes, and they would be, and it was very successful. Uh, we taught every 20 minutes, we changed a group of, it went like groups of 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it was really wonderful because the audience got yeah, split, and we, again, we, we, I wanted the audience to be transported into Buenos Aires, Argentina. I wanted them to be in Amilonga because that was the conceit, and I wanted to tell this story within the the milonga so and uh you know i i um the art with all of your support we were able to really get closer to the the, the vision that i had with the show i mean really it was it was really because of all of you who really supported the vision uh oh, and and the story and the idea and one thing that i don't know if you guys talked about i don't want me to read the rail off but one of the things that we didn't talk about was how Diane Berger, I had sent her this, this video from, from one of our rehearsals in Argentina, and she really followed us for like a period of four years. 
And, um, you know, she, I, 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 for me, it was important that, you know, that she see the show. So she, I invited her to come to, uh, to Bogota and, and her and, 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 and Ryan McKinder came to, uh, to, to uh, Bogota, Colombia and watch our show and a performance of it because it wasn't the thing that you, kind of thing you can really get a feeling for it unless you you saw it live because the yeah. environment was so important. Well, I think um, you know it's so much about our audiences too. Like we we talk a lot about kind of the privilege we have in in Cambridge because and in Boston because folks are really game to do this sort of stuff. You know, I think um, that that. Otterball was one of the first shows that really revealed that to me about this audience. Um, because I was like, oh, we'll be lucky if we get 20 people up there doing tango lessons, right? I think I think that the three of us were out in Buenos Aires one night um, during rehearsals, and I was like, y'all, this is a great idea. We might just be pulling teeth to get people up there to do it. And you remember for that first preview, we had to set up two waves because we had so many people trying to get up there that we had to be like, okay, we're going to do this group for 20 minutes. We're going to have this group lined up. We're going to get them off stage. Um, and that, that's true. I think for a lot of those, like uh, ART audiences are so like really game to jump into, to any kind of audience participation or really like immerse themselves in the show and not, not in the like <clears throat> immersive with a capital I, you know, sleep no more or whatever. Um, even in, in these, these sort of like bringing them into the world a little bit more um, comfortably for some folks. I think they're, they're really game to jump in. Oh, yeah. All right, I, I gotta answer some questions. Okay. Of course. Even though I could, you know, ask you a million more, there's so many things we didn't get to. I was so looking forward to talking about um, our experience going to gay clubs in, in Buenos Aires, <laughs> which was like, you know. Yeah, the after, you know how some shows have the after? Yes, after takes. I joked with the Lazores last week that I also need I, I need libations with Lunsford. That can be the, the follow up. I said we can have the post conversation and have martinis. Yeah. <laughs> oh, martinis. It was happening like at 10 p.m. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, one of the first questions is um, what are you up to now? What projects are you working on right now? I'm, 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 I'm Jack, go for it, because this is this. Um, uh, so we've, so we've, we've, uh, we've optioned a play that we're working on that we're developing into a musical. That's that's um, in very early stages that um, Sergio's going to direct and choreograph that um, um, we're, we're excited about. We're not quite sure what direction it's going to go in. The, uh, the play is called Real Women Have Curves. Um, and we've, um, we're going to develop that into a musical, and we're figuring out what direction that will go in, but we're very excited about it. It's, um, about a young uh, Latin girl, sort of uh, similar to Arbal. <laughs> mm. Maybe it's a theme for us. <laughs> 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 I just really think about it. And so, right the well, second, it's funny, uh, it's funny. It's funny. yeah, it's a, a story about a young girl who is, um, uh, uh, again, it's a coming of age story about a young Mexican American girl, um, kind of uh, coming to terms with what it's mm. like to be a woman in, a, in America with uh, immigrant parents. It's a beautiful story that um, um, has a, a huge musical element of uh, with uh, Mexican-American music. And so we're working on that and developing it and, and very excited about that. And then Sergio's working on, um, uh, you want to talk about that? Well, so, you know, one of the things that I think, again, Arabal ignited this idea for me that I really needed to be at the forefront of making sure that our stories, Latinx stories are being heard um, and are being told and so I've made, you know, I made a sort of personal contract with myself that I was wanted, I really wanted to make sure that, that I, I, I really, you know, uh, dealt with all of, did that. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, and presently I'm working on, on various ideas and, and one of them actually is really interesting because it's another, it's a, it's a, based on a book that was uh, uh, <clears throat> written by a, a Harvard law professor, mm. uh, Alberto Gonzalez, who, wrote a book called Lives in Limbo, and it was optioned by a producer, Penny Koenig, who went to, uh, she took a leadership class at, at, uh, at Harvard. And so we're working on that piece, written by Christina Quintana, which is a really, really talented young writer. Uh, so we're working on that. And uh, another one that I'm really excited about is uh, uh, one called Waiting for Snow in Havana, written by Richard uh, Eyre, who is a Harvard, a Yale law professor. Uh, and it's the retelling of um, 
It's a, it takes place in Cuba, and it's about this young boy who uh, is part, was part of the Pedro Pan movement. Uh, and when Fidel took over, uh, a lot of parents sent their kids to Miami. Mm. Uh, 14,000 children were sent to Miami, orphan, really. And they thought, you know, this is going to be a period of, you know, two months, three months. But in essence, you know, some of the kids didn't see their parents for decades. Uh, so we're, that's been adapted into a, into a musical as well. And there is various other ones, but those are, these are the three that, that I'm very excited about. Uh, in particular, you know, Real Women's of Curse, because it, it really is, um, it is a, it's a female empowering story, but it's really... Uh, but immigration. Uh, yeah, it's immigration. It's a story that I know very well. And, and also, you know, it's a love song to my, to my the women in my family and all the, all the women yeah. that I know. Of course. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, here's a great question um, for you, Sergio. What was the career transition like for you um, as a dancer then becoming a choreographer? So what was that turning point of that aha moment for you? Yeah, you know, I think because I had faced, you know, 30 years ago, the, the way before that, the transition from being a student and academic to becoming a dancer, I, I learned that, you know, that you really have to listen to your instincts and you list, really have to listen to your inner voice. And so I prepared before, you know, I, it wasn't just like all of a sudden I'm going to be a dancer. You know, I had trained while I was in university. So I had done my homework so that when I made the transition, I made it successfully. But I also, you know, took a leap of faith. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a dancer. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to go to America. Same thing happened with being a choreographer. I knew that while I was dancing, that at some point I was going to be a choreographer and eventually I was going to be a director. But it was important for me to be able to do the work, to be able to study. As a choreographer, you don't go to school. You know, you learn by doing, you learn from by watching, you learn by studying from great mentors. And so I knew that Fosse was going to be my last show. And as a matter of fact, every night when I dance Bojangles, which is one of the numbers I did as Mr. Bojangles, every night I sort of danced it knowing that I was never going to perform again, which was a, a, a bit, you know, it was a bittersweet moment for me because here I was doing the thing that I love to do the most, but yet I knew that I wasn't going to be, you know, performing in that way. Uh, I was be, I was going to be doing it in a different kind of way. So yeah, yeah that's incredible. Transition and how I knew it was important for me to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, great. There's time for one more question, which I think is <clears throat> sort of maybe for me and Jack to answer. But let's do one. Let's do one other one first. Um, do you have any advice or wisdom for a junior in college who's studying music theater? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think for, for all, of, all of the young artists out there, and it's really important nowadays to be able to do all three really well. You know, I grew up in a time period, in a time period where I was, a, I was a dancer. I mean, I, I can't sing. I can't sing, and I was lucky enough to do five broad, Broadway broad shows. That was a different time. I think that it's very important to hone in each one of those, um, those uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, Discipline. This expert, yes, disciplines really well. Um, and really, always, always, always listen to your inner voice. Don't let it defeat you. And fear is always going to be the greatest and biggest obstacle. Do not let that defeat you. And just have really clear goals about what it is that you want to do and where you want to be. Hmm. Jack, the one question that has come up several times that <laughs> I think is for you and me to try to answer is um, when will our ball be seen again? Uh, so, um, the, we're working on an opportunity for that to be seen outside of Washington and Maryland at a place called the Old Bay Theater. Um, and then, um, you know, COVID-19 has really hurt a lot of theater companies in America and, uh, across the country. And, and so we were in a very good place to having that happen in August of 2021. Um, but, you know, of course, the challenges of what's happening right now in our country have really hurt uh, lots of opportunities for not only our show Arba, but but for many shows and 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 um, so so we'll see. I mean, we still have um, you know when when you are producing and, and you 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 have some resources and you're able to save the uh, save the set, um, um, which we've been able to do. Uh, we we can hang on with a prayer that we can make it happen again. But um, it's challenging. You know, I mean, it's challenging. Unfortunately, some art is going to suffer because of what's happening right now. Um, 
help our wall won't be one of the things that suffers. We, we'd like to maybe get another production of it up, but um, but it really just depends on how things go with uh, with our. Let's yeah, I mean, <clears throat> my fingers are definitely crossed because the team behind that piece is just so incredible, and you know we can't say enough about the talent of the dancers and musicians who make that piece. Um, I mean, just you you think it a lot about performers, but this team really exemplified like leaving everything on that stage every night, um, right? Like every bit of energy, every bit of like love, it's just all over that stage um, after every performance, which was, you could feel that energy like radiating in the middle of that room. I think that's what made everyone leave that piece was set on such a high, because not only was the story so compelling, but you could just get that energy coming from those performers every night, it was wild. Yeah, you just felt like they, they they truly were dancing like they were never going to dance again. Like this was yeah. the only performance that they will ever dance in their lives. And it was like that every night. So that's certainly a driving force in, in our need to to try to pursue and, and have another production. But of course it's just challenging these times. So Yeah. Well I want look, I wanna thank the two of you so much. I love and adore you, and it's so great to get to sort of banter with you in front of a bunch of other people. Um, and I'm so grateful you took the time and, you know, held this conversation and co-parented and did the whole thing seamlessly and flawlessly. So I, I'm, I'm so grateful to you both. Thank you. For, for, for all of those people who are, who are sitting with us for the last hour, please stay healthy, stay safe, stay creative, and keep, keep the hope. Stay, you know, keep, stay hopeful. And together, we, we can always over, we're going to overcome this. So. And tune in every Tuesday at noon to have lunch with Lunsford. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. 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 I'm going to get a theme song next week. You wait. Ellen better look out, girl. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to echo everything that you get her t shirt. I'm with Lunsford. She's. Yeah, I just want to echo everything that, that, that Jack and Sergio said, and, and I'm so grateful to all of you, our audience and our supporters. You know, as, as Jack mentioned, it's, it's a really difficult time for a lot of institutions right now, and we are so energized by the support and love um, that we're getting from our audience and from, and from our supporters and from folks like you. So but we, we love spending this time with you every week. Um, we've got more content coming, so stay tuned. Um, and yeah, look out for news who will be, who'll be on Lunch with Lunsford uh, next week. Looking forward. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Gracias. Bye. <laughs>